happy Wednesday morning to you. Hello, Chen. Hi, Alex. Good morning, Carl. Foreign Wanderer says, hey, Prof. Hello, hello. Good morning, Paul. <laughs> Fallopian Tube. Morning. Some of these names. Ben, good morning. Good morning, Hank. Finbar. Jenna. Oh, we got a little Lil Z here. You can put little doggies in the chat with Lil Z. Good morning. Glad you guys are doing well. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Are you guys morning people? Top of the morning to ya, says Kraz. Krista says, no, I am not a morning person. Neither am I. My wife, Hannah, she's a morning person. She'll get up at like six and feel fantastic. If I get up at six, I, um, it's not good. I'm not in the right state of mind. Is that a Pit Viper's hat, Doc? Yes, it is. I recently discovered Pit Viper. They make primarily sunglasses. It's amazing. I should get a puppy like Professor Rehanian. Oh yeah, if you guys don't know, Dr. Rehanian got this puppy golden doodle. And it's just adorable. Oh my goodness. Did he show it in, in class? Oh, I didn't change the title. got to get this going here. Okay, so it's it's not Monday anymore. It's Wednesday. 9-2. And um, we're doing bang bang control. Well, eventually. We got to finish up some other stuff first. He was potty training during your section? Wait, this is not Minecraft. I know, disappointing, right? All right. Let us, let's get started, because we got a lot to do. We'll review a little bit of where we came from. All right, so we introduced the goal of our class in a nutshell. We're studying how to get a car from point A to point B as fast as possible, right? So um, we're going to try to do a bunch of examples to study that. And this is the first one we did. We did a carpool race between The Rock himself and the two-time champion Dr. Disrespect, okay? Okay. And it, it boils down to some simple physics. It's, it's like the most basic implementations of Newton's law in this case. Mass times acceleration is the force. And for road vehicles, the force that we're interested in is tractive force, which is generated at the tire road interface. And we'll get into more details about that. But we, we took this example as an opportunity to get some basic kinematic relationships. It's been a long summer. We got to refresh some of this stuff. So if you calculate the position as a function of time for a constant acceleration um, problem, we found out that um, Dr. Disrespect lost this race. And, and the main principle here is... If you have more acceleration, you're always going to be ahead in a race. So for racing, the, the goal is to maximize acceleration 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, so let's. I want to go down here because 
okay, how do we maximize acceleration for a road vehicle? Um, to, to make it most simple, you want to maximize this ratio right here, which that's the acceleration. So you want to make the numerator, the tractive force as big as possible, and you want to make the mass as small as possible. Okay, that's the takeaway from the first lecture. Now, um, let's talk about a formula car because formula cars are optimized for getting from A to B as fast as possible on um, lots of different tracks. So I know some of you were like, oh, Ferrari, boo. I I'm so new to Formula One, I don't even have a favorite team yet. I don't know. I just picked one at random. But I want to give you some stats about Formula cars because this is going to drive home um, the, uh, this property of acceleration. Let me look this up. Okay. So for formula racing, the last I checked, the minimum allowable mass is, for, for your car, is 728 kilograms with a driver. And uh, for fuel, 105 kilograms. Now, to give you some perspective, the average car, your average passenger vehicle is 1,300 kilograms. It's almost two times as heavy. All right, so uh, a formula car is really light. The goal is to maximize acceleration. So we have this property of minimizing mass. Um, so let's let's talk about the acceleration really quick that you can experience in a formula car. So it's not uncommon for F1 drivers to experience, uh, let's fill this in, 1.45 Gs in longitudinal acceleration. So that's like you're going down a straight, think of yourself at a stoplight, the light turns green, you put the pedal to the metal, 1.45 G's. If you don't know what a G is, that's uh, in units of gravitational acceleration. So 1 G would be 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is one and a half times that gravitational acceleration. And when they decelerate, so if they brake before heading into a corner, it's, it's way more. It's like four to five G's. So four to five times the amount of typical gravitational acceleration. Okay, so it's just, it's, it's intense, all right? Braking with that much um, deceleration, it's a shock to the body. Now, when they go into corners, we have this lateral acceleration come in, which is like the side-to-side -side acceleration, and that also gets really intense, maybe even more than braking because that can get up to like five or six g's out of curiosity are you posting the notes filled in for us or only the blank notes i'm going to post the filled in notes but um i'm that i'm going to post them once i finish like a given set so like i didn't post this one because i didn't get to the bottom yet and and part of the reason too is i want to um have you guys follow along either live or in the video because there's research they've, they've done research on this uh having classes where people follow along with handouts versus when you just give them the notes and they find that people retain information better with handouts so i'm just trying to um do i'm trying to implement that but yeah yeah i will post the filled in notes as well so, like, we'll finish this one today, and I'll get it up after class. Okay, so formula cars, they generate a lot of acceleration. So, how much tractive force are we talking about? How much force is generated at the tires to get these crazy um, accelerations? So, we're just going to stick with this basic uh, Newton's law to get a first cut 
of that figure, all right? So while they're accelerating, let's say we have 800 kilograms. That's the, the car plus the driver plus the fuel times 1.45 Gs of acceleration. And I'm going to convert Gs to um, metric units, you know, meters per second squared. So 1 G is 9.81 meters per second squared. If you multiply this out, this right hand side is going to be equal to the the force required to generate that type of acceleration. And we're talking about 11,380 newtons, which is 2,560 uh, like pounds, pound force, or like one and a quarter U.S. tons. So um, it's it's a lot. It's a lot right there. Okay, and then um, decelerating. So we said they can generate more acceleration while decelerating. So braking really eats up the tires because look at this. Let's do the same calculation. So the mass times the acceleration. What acceleration did I want to do? Let's say they break at like 5 Gs, which probably just um, messes with your stomach a little bit, I'm guessing. I haven't tried it myself. So that's that's quite a bit more force, 39,000 newtons. What is the meaning of lateral force acting on the car during deceleration? Deceleration would only be in the direction of motion, right? No, that's that's right. So um, right now we're just talking about moving in a straight. Um, lateral acceleration comes into play when the tires are trying to hold a car into the corner. So when I mentioned lateral acceleration earlier, I just wanted to give you a figure for reference that like when we're decelerating, braking like in a straight line, we can get like four or five G's in a formula car. Also, when you're in a corner, just maintaining speed, you can experience like that same level of G's. So we're not really talking about lateral acceleration yet. Um, and if you convert this force, okay, let's, let's put it in pounds. So we got 8,000 pounds, close to 9,000 pounds. If you decelerate at 5 Gs, would it be negative Gs or positive? It would be negative. But right now I'm just giving magnitudes, basically. So when you're accelerating forward, the acceleration is in the direction, like out of your windshield. We'd call that positive. When you're braking, you're accelerating, you know, backwards. So... If you call positive acceleration pointing straight out your windshield, then yeah, braking is negative acceleration in that coordinate system. All right, so this is like 4.4 US tons. Thank you for your questions, by the way. And I think in, uh, like a, a, a small elephant weighs about that much. <laughs> so it's a, it's a lot of force being transmitted to the ground at that tire contact patch road interface. Okay, let us, let's do another example. So I wanna do a braking distance problem for a, a formula car. If they can brake with like five Gs um, well, how long does the car move before it actually stops? And in this example, I'm going to show you another useful kinematic relationship that's going to help you with uh, the first homework as well. If you haven't started the first homework, please do. That's due Monday morning, bright and early, 9 a.m. Has anybody finished yet? Or has anybody started yet? Oh, jeez. Okay. Breaking distance. So let's say um, 
a formula car applies a constant five you got a negative distance for part two <laughs> okay so let's say the the car is traveling at 67 meters per second so that's roughly 150 miles per hour and let's say i slam on five g's of braking force and let's say i can maintain a constant uh force there so what's going to be the stopping distance so this is the um kinematic relationship i want to show you so acceleration we know that is the time derivative of velocity so like uh, i use dot notation two dots means two time derivatives one dot means one time derivative so acceleration is the time derivative of velocity but you can expand this out as the derivative of velocity with respect to position times the derivative of position with respect to time so like if you were to multiply this out you know the dx's would cancel and, and it would still be equal right okay so this is equal to dx dot dx times because dx dt is just x dot so we have this cool little relationship acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to position times the velocity and so what what can we do with this let's rearrange things a little bit we have the acceleration times dx is the velocity times dx dot so that's the same equation just rearranged and then we can integrate this so the left hand side we integrate with respect to position so like we can go from some initial position x naught to some final position x f and it's um, x double dot dx and then the right hand side you integrate with respect to velocity because it's dx dot so you have some initial speed final speed x dot dx dot so it turns out this kinematic relationship is super useful for um, solving examples like this one, like braking distance um, or uh, how far um, you need to travel to get up to a certain speed or whatever. Okay, so let, let's integrate this. Now, if we consider the acceleration to be constant, so just consider this to be a constant for now we've just been doing constant acceleration problems so that basically comes out of the integral and this will just be the acceleration times xf minus x naught so the acceleration times how much distance you covered is equal to if we integrate this out it'll be one half your final velocity squared minus your initial velocity squared. So that's just integrating out the right hand side, evaluating it at the limits. Okay, so this is going to be useful for this stopping distance problem because look at this. Um, oh, and this, this goes back to our earlier um, question about uh, it, deceleration being positive or negative so in this problem I'm considering X to be positive like down the stretch so if I'm decelerating I'm gonna have minus 5 G's here for my acceleration term but I, I'm gonna convert that to metric so like 1 G is 9.81 meters per second squared and so so this is my acceleration term and then this I'm going to multiply this by my final position minus my initial position and to make this easy let's just say I initially started at position zero 
Like when I applied my brakes, that's position zero. And XF is the position where I am when I come to a stop. All right, so the right hand side, I have my final velocity squared minus my initial velocity squared. So my final velocity should be zero. I want to stop the Formula One car before I hit um, the golden doodle puppy that I was trying to avoid in the first place. Okay, zero squared. Really drive it home, it's gotta be zero. Okay, and then we subtract our initial velocity squared. So we're going at 150 miles per hour, which is 67 meters per second squared. So this is really nice because look, the only unknown in this equation is my final position, which is my, my stopping distance. So that's why uh, this kinematic relationship is super useful for this type of problem. So let's calculate this. Okay, so I'm gonna have minus 67 uh, squared over two. That's gonna be meters squared, second squared. I'm just doing some algebra here. Do we need to do these derivations for the homework or can we just use the standard kinematic equations? It's okay to use the standard kinematic equations, the, the short answer. But let me tell you this, my philosophy on homework is um, when you have a grader looking at your homework, you want to basically convince the grader, look, I know what I'm doing here. So if you turn in something and you show like, look, I, I've written out my derivation, um, like the way that I answer um, when I work through these problems, I go through every single step like this every time. Like I do it because I want to show you guys every single detail, but even when I'm doing it on my own, I do it this way because what if you get to the end and you have an answer that doesn't make sense? Well, if you have written out all of this stuff, it's very easy to debug your own work. You know what I mean? Like I might find a sign error earlier or something like that. So even though it's more writing initially, from experience, I think in the long run, this is the faster way to get it done. And when the grader sees it, they're like, okay, this person is serious. Because um, if somebody turns in a homework and there's just like the answer, there's no work shown, it looks sloppy, they're like, what's going on here? And then if the answer is wrong, you have nothing to go on. So that's just a little aside about, you can use just the formula, I'm, but I think it's best if you do the grind. Those are my two cents. Okay, so I have this, minus five times 9.81 meters per second squared. So this is just solving for XF from that equation. And I got, can you post the completed notes before the weekend so I can use it to figure out the homework? Of course. But the best, the quickest way to get the completed notes is to follow along with me in lecture. Like I'll post these ones today, but um, like, I, like I said earlier, I didn't post these on Monday because I wasn't finished yet. Um, but now we're at the bottom of this one, so I finished. Okay, 45, wait, this should not be meters per second. This should be meters. So think about this, 45 meters, what's, well, that, that's like 120 feet, roughly, a little more than that. You're going 150 miles per hour, slam on the brakes. That's pretty amazing. That's what Formula One braking force can do. Okay. I'm going to move on to our next topic. The topic of bang, bang, control. So if you have the handout in front of you, 
let's let's talk about this. This is pretty fun. Have you guys heard of Bang Bang uh, before? Other than like, I, I think there's a character in the Flintstones named Bang Bang, or, or I don't know. It's funny because it it, it sounds like a, a baby word or something, but um, it's actually a technical term from optimal control systems. Um, so video example would be cool. It's ba oh bam bam, not bang bang, right? <laughs> bam bam, OMG. Sorry, I, it's been a while since I saw the Flintstones. Okay. All right. So, what is Okay, yeah, it, it also comes up in, like, thermostat. Like, you, you might have, um, bang, bang basically means, like, on, off. So, for a temperature control in a home, a more of a simple control system might be, um, we just turn on the heat, turn it off, or turn on the AC, turn it off, and keep the temperature within a certain range. But that's a little different than, um what I'm talking about here. They they do that kind of control to save cost, but bang bang control is actually, um, it's common in minimum time problems. So that what that is is trying to accomplish some task as fast as possible. That's a minimum time problem. Um, so like injectors intermittently turning on and cutting, maybe, maybe. Okay, but you're trying to do something as fast as possible, but here's the catch. You have lower and upper bounds on your control input. That means um, if I'm trying to push something as fast as possible, I don't just have infinite force. There's some upper bound on the force that I can actually apply. There's also a lower bound, which is important in, in racing. So how is bang bang control related to racing? Well, while you're racing, drivers encounter straights so that's when you're driving straight and they want to finish that as fast as possible obviously however there's constraints on the entry and exit speeds of these straights um okay T to explain that a little more for example drivers have to slow down at the end of each straight because um interesting races aren't just one straight there's there's actually corners as well so you need to drop down to a safe speed for entering the corner at the end of the straight so um, further we know that vehicles produce a limited amount of acceleration or deceleration so even a formula car we know the limits. It's like one and a half G's for acceleration, deceleration, maybe four or five G's. Um, and it's even hard to maintain those. But these create lower and upper bounds on what you can actually uh, control for the car. So because this is a problem where it's minimum time, you're trying to do something as fast as possible, but because there's limits on the upper and lower bounds, we can use optimal control theory, specifically bang bang control, and apply it to racing. So um, below, we're gonna do a sequence of examples that are gonna try to give you an understanding of bang bang control. So I'm, there's gonna be four examples here, and they're gonna each get a little more complicated. Okay, so the first one, you're competing in a, excuse me, you're competing in a quarter mile drag race, all right? And you need to determine an optimal racing strategy for each case. So there's gonna be four different cases. So it's gonna be a quarter mile drag race, but there's gonna be different sets of rules. Um, <clears throat> so you're gonna come up with a racing strategy in terms of acceleration, specifically like when should I be throttling and how much so when am I pressing the pedal and when am I braking and how intensely am I braking? So the rules are, assume you can apply any acceleration at any time as long as it falls between the lower and upper bounds. And, and this will make more sense because I have like a little figure you can follow along with. Okay, so here is the first race. 
starting from rest, your goal is to finish the quarter mile race in the shortest amount of time. All right, and, and here, if you look at the vertical axis, we have acceleration, and here's the upper bound, which is maximum acceleration. Here you have the lower bound, which is negative, and that's when you're braking. And for now, we're assuming that the, um, the upper bound is equal in magnitude to the lower bound. So um, you have equal accelerating or braking capabilities. And your first goal, uh, so, so what I want you to do is fill in on this chart, like what do you think you should be doing during the race? Just draw a line. Do you have a guess? Okay, so the solution for this one, I'm just going to draw it on here. If you just want to get from point A to point B as fast as possible, from the first lecture we know, wait, are we assuming there's a wall at the finish line and where to stop. In real life cases, there's runoff, so no braking until after you hit the finish line. Okay, yes, assume assume that there's space after the finish line where you're not gonna crash into a wall or a puppy. You have space. <clears throat> so this, this is the solution. In an ideal world, you apply max acceleration the whole time. Max acceleration the whole race. Why? Because this generates the most speed over time. And you'll cover the most distance. And the ideal solution would the acceleration be infinity? Yeah, okay, that's that's true. <laughs> if you could have infinite acceleration, that's ideal. But the constraint on all of these examples is you have to stay within the lower and upper bounds that I have specified. But but you're right, Chin. We would want infinite acceleration, except that would probably kill you. How many G's can you take before it causes problems? Super grippy tires as well. Yeah, that's an assumption that these tires are not slipping. They're not burning out. We're, we're assuming that uh, we have all the grip. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You black out at 8 G's if you are not trained. Okay, wow. Right, so so we we have some pretty basic assumptions here. We're assuming that the um, the tires can can handle it. Let, let's assume that's all taken into account in these limits. It's not the speed that kills you; it's how fast you stop. A quote by Jeremy Clarkson. No, that's a. Uh, I mean that that makes sense because um, cars generate much more deceleration than acceleration. Paul says, good to know. I uh, will avoid racing at 8 Gs. Good for you. The NHTSA standard for sudden impact acceleration on a human that would cause severe injury or death is 75 Gs. 65, wow. Yeah, it's also important how long you're sustaining those Gs. Okay, let's get into a little more interesting case. Okay, case two. Now your goal is to finish the quarter mile in the shortest amount of time, but you need to stop at the finish line. So you start at rest, you have to finish at rest and uh, just pretend there's a wall back there. So you now you don't have any runoff at the end. You got to stop, but you still want to finish this as fast as possible. Um, I have some work in here, but I want to scroll down here first because I just want you to think about what is your uh, strategy? 
obviously you need to break at some point in this strategy. And, and this is where bang, bang, you'll, you'll see what it means. But um, so, yeah, do you do something like this, like this? So draw what you think. I'll give you like 10 more seconds. Don't think about it too much, but. Positive till one eighth and then go down to negative from one eighth until one fourth. Yes. Okay, so let's draw this. So halfway, that's the one eighth mile. We're going to make a transition from max acceleration down to maximum braking. That, theoretically, from optimal control, this is the fastest time to do the maneuver. Full on followed by full off. And this is why we call it bang bang. Yes, are we assuming equal uh, upper and lower bounds? Yep. Those distances or those magnitudes are the same. Okay, so um, now I want to try to give an intuitive explanation for um, why this is. So max acceleration, then halfway transition to maximum braking. Okay. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Okay, so solution, this requires a bang bang approach. So now you know what bang bang is. It's maximum on followed by maximum off. Um, so let's answer the question, when do we transition from accelerating to braking? So let's, let's break it down. I mean, intuitively, if you have equal accelerating and braking capacities, it kind of makes sense, but um, we're going to really try to nail this down because this will help us if we do more complicated cases. So I think the easiest way to look at this is um, in terms of work. Let me get the right pin here. So work is force integrated over distance, and that's equal to the change in kinetic energy. So what, what is the change in kinetic energy? You have your final energy, which is one half mass times velocity squared. So that's kinetic energy. And then you take the difference between that and your initial kinetic energy. Now, for this problem, we started at rest we finished at rest, so what is the change in kinetic energy? You go from zero velocity to zero velocity, it's zero. So we know um, the change in kinetic energy, it, well, it's zero by the end of the race. And we know that accelerating, you have an option here, positive or negative work. If we consider, um, our positive coordinate to just be going down the length of the straight. Well, we, we know accelerating does positive work in this case. And if we define a constant tractive force, we're just considering constant force at this point. Let's call that force F1. And let's say the distance that we cover is X1. So the work that we do, the positive work we do while accelerating is F1 times X1. All right. And then we know that that is going to be followed by braking, which is going to do negative work. And let's say that the, the magnitude of this force is F2. And the distance we cover is x2. So we know that it's going to be doing negative work. So I have to take the negative of that magnitude 
over the distance that it's acting. Okay, so the change in work has to sum up to zero because we know it starts at rest and it ends at rest. So work one plus work two is the change in kinetic energy. So um, F1, X1 minus F2, X2, that's got to equal zero. And then the assumption right now is that the tractive force F1 is equal to the braking force. They're equal in magnitude. So um, then we're going to have, you know, let's just call it F1 equals F2 equals F. So we know that F times X1 minus X2 equals zero. So the only way that this happens is x1 equals x2. So that's why the accelerating distance has to be equal to the braking distance. And then, uh, okay, so exactly what are these? Well, you have the constraint of the length of the straight. We know if you add those two together, it's a quarter mile. So if they're equal, um, x1 is an eighth of a mile, x2 is an eighth of a mile. So that's how you break it down mathematically step by step. Does that make sense? We're moving along today. I think we're actually going to make it through these sets of notes. Good, good. Little C. Let's throw let's throw one of those in the chat. Wait, did I type it wrong? I typed it wrong. There we go. You guys have to learn the, the Twitch emotes. That's going to improve your experience so much. Okay, case three. This case, so our third race, it's similar to the previous, but the only difference is you have to start and end the race at 30 miles per hour. Okay, so instead of starting and ending at rest, you start and end at 30 miles per hour. What is your strategy? Think about it now. Do we have a good solution? Okay, guess what? Guess what? It is, um, it's exactly the same strategy. Same solution. Yes. And why is it the same solution? Well, for the same reasoning, the change in kinetic energy is zero overall. You start with some uh, finite kinetic energy and you end the race a quarter mile down the stretch with the same amount. And um, for these minimum time problems, the fastest way to do something is bang, bang. So this is the fastest way to do it. Okay, so same as our second case because the change in kinetic energy is zero overall and this is still a minimum time problem with upper and lower bounds on the control input. All right, so that's case three. We have one more case, and this is getting closer to a um, realistic situation in racing. Okay, so this is going to be the same as case three, uh, meaning that we start at 30 miles per hour and we end at 30 miles per hour, except 
you have three times more braking force than tractive force. So this is more like a, a realistic car where you have much more braking capacity. And so um, on this, I modified the graph to reflect that. You see that the acceleration line is, um, it's got much less magnitude than the braking. So what are you going to do? I'll give you a couple seconds. Three quarters acceleration, one quarter break from Phil. Uh, is this the integral of acceleration dt? equals int velocity dx. You could do that. You could use the work equation to find the ratio. Send it to 3 16 then break. Wait, 3 16 So break really early in the race? Okay, hit the break later. Accelerate to 3 16 mile, then break to a quarter. Two people got the 3 16 Wait, so you're saying you accelerate real early and then you break like the rest of the way? You can accelerate for three times more distance than you break. Okay. That is correct. So think about it. The change in kinetic energy, it's still zero. So the work done by accelerating needs to be canceled out by the work done by braking. Now, the work done by accelerating is like less effective in this case because I have three times less force. So I would have to accelerate three times the distance. Um, to do the same amount of work. I almost confused myself there. So you got to. Accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. As much as your little heart can. But I know that um, I have to slow back down. And there we go. So three quarters of that straight you're accelerating and then you break for the last quarter. Okay, let's, let's write that out. Does that make sense? So the way I look at it, the braking force needs to undo the work of the tractive force. We know that for um, the change in kinetic energy to be zero. So breaking because it's three times stronger so we just need to keep the two areas equal oh chin that's a very good way of looking at this that's exactly right uh you can make this area equal to this because the work is so that's like f1 and then the distance is x1, and the area of that rectangle would just be f1 times x1. And then the magnitude of the braking force, if we call it f2, uh, and the distance is x2. So we have to make that area equal. And the reason that it's these square shapes instead of some other shape that has equal area is this minimum time issue. Like you could do some other combination that... Um, brings you uh, back to rest at the finish line. But we're, and we're not like proving this using optimal control theory, but just trust me, the fastest way is 100% on followed by 100% off. So that's why it has this rectangular shape. So braking generates um, 
three times the force in this example. So it requires three times less distance to do the same amount of work. Good. I like that uh, area analogy. I didn't. I didn't think of that, but that that definitely applies. Um, so now, uh, next time you're playing Super Mario or whatever, um, you know the temptation is always to have pedal to the metal in these racing games. I think that's how all of us start to play. But the the counterintuitive thing is that racing is actually done fastest with employing a lot of brakes, like depressing the brakes to the floor. Okay, so we're going to wrap up with some takeaways. We're finishing up like a little bit early today. It's okay. It's the first week. Um, okay, let's do these main takeaways. The fastest way to complete a straight while exiting a straight at a safe velocity is to apply maximum acceleration so like maximum tractive force followed by maximum braking force And where are we getting this? This follows from the principle of bang, bang, control. And if you're interested in, in uh, digging a little deeper into that, you want to look up optimal control minimum time problem. You can take optimal control at UB, by the way. Dr. Singh teaches that. I think in the I think that's going on this semester. Maybe you can sneak into one of those meetings. That's where I learned about bang bang control. Because I went to graduate school at UB. Bang bang control. It's really hard when I learned that class. Yeah. Aren't these just step functions? Yeah, you can parameterize this with a step function or a heavy side function. Continuous control systems, Paul, I don't know if they'll touch on bang-bang control and continuous controls. But if you take optimal control, that's a, a graduate course you're going to, you'll learn about it, you'll love it. Okay, so for constant acceleration problems, the transition point between accelerating and braking can be determined most easily by, in my opinion, um calculating the work done by uh, accelerating and braking and then keep in mind the change in the kinetic energy so today we did some simpler examples where um, you enter and exit the straight with the same amount of kinetic energy. But you could apply this same technique if you uh, leave at different speeds. You can use the same exact technique. So practically, in racing, vehicles generate much more braking force than tractive force. So this transition point from accelerating to braking happens close to the end of the straight. I was watching that um, Netflix Formula One show the other day, and uh, one of the racers was saying, like, improving in Formula One is kind of seeing um, how long you can delay braking at the end of a straight. So it's kind of that, uh, it's kind of like playing chicken. There, there's a lot at stake. You don't want to crash the car, but you can always keep in your mind the optimal way for getting down a straight is 
delaying the braking as much as you can um, because you're trying to push the car to that limit. Uh, is it going to be too much load to take system analysis and opti optimal control? I had already taken continuous controls. I think system analysis and optimal control is probably doable. Optimal control is a big investment, but system analysis is a little bit less. You can watch Global Time Attack series too. What is that, Global Time Attack? I haven't heard of that one. Um, guys, I'm going to bring back some tunes. I'm going to bring back some tunes. Five seventy one is easy to take. I need a printer for these handouts. Yeah, wait, okay, so how many of you guys are using the handouts? If you're not, I won't be I won't be offended. But I like ideally if you can, I think it's better. Okay. Krista, me, okay, great. Ricardo, hey, you're here. Welcome, Ricardo. Carl, okay, so we got Okay, so you guys like these? I, I look at them while I write my notes. Okay. I wish I had a printer. <laughs> I know. I I don't have a working printer for them. Okay. Yeah, if you can if you can mark them up on a tablet, that's obviously really nice. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep posting these. I am gonna post the filled out handouts. Like, so after this class, I'll, I'll put up these two. But keep in mind, like, if I don't, like, finish a set, I probably won't post it that day. So if you want notes the quickest, follow along with the video. Um, I'm sorry for those of you who, who can't, like, uh, print these in some way. I heard that UB printers are available. So, like, if, if you are in Buffalo right now and if you go to UB... Um, I heard it's like a self-serve system. Not 100% sure. Um, they're just expensive. But wait, don't you? Oh yeah, printers are expensive, that's right. But I think as a UB student, you have a, a budget that you can print a certain amount during a semester. As a side note, uh, can you update the Twitch description with the updated lecture times wait what do you mean oh okay i know what you mean i know what you mean in the description i think i i didn't change that yet it's left over from the summer they have a bunch of um printing sites around i was there yesterday okay thank you so much chimney stacks um how can we connect with our classmates oh okay so i do have a suggestion we have a discord we have a Discord page for this class, which the link is on the syllabus. Wait, what is today, Wednesday? Do we have office hours? We have, I think I'm holding office hours today. So I'm gonna be on that Discord from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. this evening. So you can come ask me questions. There's like, um, I made a couple channels, so I think, that's one way to remotely connect with your classmates. Like you can post uh, stuff in there. I don't know, maybe we can get together on campus at some point. Post a cookout. I don't know. It's tough with this whole COVID thing. I don't like it. Where's the link for Discord? If you go to the syllabus posted on UB Learn, the Discord link is there. There's a hyperlink in there. Burgers, beer, bang, bang. Good. Yes, yes, yes. I don't like this COVID stuff. Got to do a lot of OG hiking, though. Yeah, I definitely did some hiking this summer, some paddle boarding. Uh, wait, what are we going to do, though, when it gets cold? That's what I've been thinking about. Like, in the summer, because this COVID thing started at the end of the spring, right? And it, 
and it was warming up so we could get outside, we could take a walk. Um, what are we going to do in the fall and the winter? I need suggestions. Snowboard. Oh, no. Snowboarding. Bring the grill inside. <laughs> okay, snowboarding's probably good to go. Apple picking. Okay, that's that's good. A fall guy's turning. Lift drag race. Um, learn some obscure instruments. Oh, I've got that covered. Hold on, I'm gonna get some. got a Native American flute. Hunting. Oh, I've never been hunting. I don't know if I could kill an animal, though. I, I would... Okay. So I, I, uh, I saw like some, um, I saw some YouTube video with somebody rocking the native flute and then I, I was like, I need to, I need to get one. <laughs> oh, the Titanic theme. Yeah. I need to, my dog is straight pissed right now. Yeah. That, that, uh, that probably would bother a dog. My grandpa loves this so much. He's uncontrollably moving on the ground face what, what? <laughs> wait what happened to your grandpa <laughs> what? <laughs> what happened that doesn't sound like a good thing let's start a band let's do it yeah i'll, I'll break out I, I have like um i have a guitar i have a banjo i have a ukulele i have an ocarina which i haven't even like i got that for my birthday recently um, yeah, we can break out some instruments here. Okay, what, what else are we going to do in the fall when COVID, uh, I mean, when, when quarantine is still active? I have an ocarina in Animal Crossing. Oh, nice. Very nice. Play video games, let's be honest. Fall things. Yeah. Banjos unite. Yeah, we'll bring out the banjo. Get a job? Nobody wants a job. Don't say don't say work. We just want to play. Winter equals build time. What are we gonna build? I lost my job from COVID. Sorry to hear that. I hope things turn around. Hot rods. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe a road vehicle apple picking day. Pumpkin carving day. Um. <laughs> Drag strip on Wednesday for extra credit. I have a Honda CRV. You're not gonna be you're not gonna stand a chance. Automatic transmission. You're done. My vehicle will blow up on the drag strip. Hard to beat a CRV, I know. I know, brutal. <sighs> uh, 
I hope you guys are having a good week. It's Wednesday. That means we're getting close to Friday. Chevy Colorado, I'll lose to all of y'all. Everyone out your uh, Steam account on Discord. Oh, that's a, that's a good idea. Wait, let's see. I'm gonna try to get on the Discord. We're gonna find that. the discord so you can like post general questions student discussion uh, we have video chat rooms you can use um, like latex commands let's try this sign of x squared Look at that. Look at that. Look how fancy that is. What's the word with the Discord? The word is you just got to you got to get on there. I'm new to Discord. If you guys have suggestions on how I can make our class Discord better, let me know. Did you change the Discord server? No, I don't think so. Wait, cause I have one, I have one for road vehicle and I have a different one for flight. That, that might be, that might be what's going on. Cause are, are you taking flight dynamics as well? Cause there, there's two of them. Same issue with you? Wait, it's taking you to a different place? What's the discord for this class? Go to the syllabus on UB Learns, and then there's the link. You can click on the link there. Let's do a hyperbolic sine of t squared. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I'm not in the Discord anymore, and I don't know why. What happens when you click on the link? DJ Dr. E hitting us with the straight bangers today. That's the goal. Anyone know if we have MAE? I, I don't know if we have MAE. I mean, you can post, like, um, files and stuff, you can, uh, where's the Final Fantasy VII soundtrack? I might have to bring that in. Well, I don't know, because I used to really like to play, um, like, YouTube soundtracks on the stream, but I think they're starting to crack down on copyright issues a little bit more. So that's why I have like, um, whatever this is, like I have the license to the music that I play. Who's 
the T-1000. I love that. <laughs> we get a link for Discord invite? It's on, uh... Are you part of the UB Learn Space forum? I guess I don't know. Because I'm trying to limit it to uh, just people in the class. If you're in the class, just go to UB Learn, go to the syllabus. I'm trying to protect this link. Professor, if you don't mind, can you elaborate the optimal control class by Dr. Discord? Oh man, so that class, let me tell you about optimal control. Uh, what song is this? Actually, you can look at my music thing. Okay, this is Anywhere by Violet Island. Anywhere by Violet. I will write it in the My favorite graduate class at UB. No joke. And, uh, it, yeah, MAE 672. That's the course number. And I don't know. It, for some reason, it just blew my mind. Because control systems is obviously how you control things but optimal control takes it to the next level because you answer questions like what is the fastest possible way to do something or what is the way to achieve something with minimal energy so like for example when they put a satellite into orbit they solve a problem to conserve fuel and um, so it's like a minimum fuel minimum time problem so you can solve problems like how do i get from point a to point b as fast as possible while spending the least amount of energy and so optimal control gives you a um, a framework to do those problems i definitely didn't get an a in the course i got a b i worked my butt off i think i got a b plus but it was, it was my favorite class. And that's also why I say, like, if you're interested in, in, a, in something, um, even if it's really tough, just go for it. I, I think it's just fun to learn. Is Steam free? Steam, Steam is free, but games... So the, the Discord is cool. That's a way to connect. Seems we have to buy something to add friends? Really? I don't think so. I think we can have friends on Steam for free. I have 
place. Okay, I do have PlayStation Plus. So I guess I'm okay. Or I think I have PlayStation Plus. Please help me open this link or I will die. Good thing I disabled Link, or I, I, it's bad for you. It's bad for you. Because apparently you will die if I don't click on that. But, um, I hope you uh, find another way to survive. Somebody on Discord is asking if, if Fall Guys is cross-platform. That's a good question. All right, everybody. Um, I got to get going on some other stuff. We're going to be back here on Friday. We're going to be back here on Friday for more road vehicle dynamics. Um, flight dynamics is at 3 p.m. Eastern later today. Um, this has been fun. Thank you, guys showing up participating have a fantastic day